holding as agrology, um, really just seeing the importance of, you know, the regenerative movement is um, gaining so much steam and there, there really seems to be a, a great space for collaboration and kind of continual education because this is all very cutting edge stuff. So we need to learn from the, the pioneers and the people who are really taking, um, yeah, you know, taking the cutting edge and pushing it a little bit further. And that's why we invited uh, Kane Thompson from O'Neill Vintners and Distillers. Um, we're really excited to have him here. And uh, yeah, Kane, if you want to give yourself um, an introduction, I'm sure you can do a better job than I can. And uh, and then we can jump into a little, well, basically what we're going to do is a short presentation on what they've been doing at O'Neill, and then we'll jump into some questions and answers. Awesome. Thank you, Charlie. And good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Kane Thompson. I'm the Head of Sustainability for O'Neill Witness and Distillers, so oversee all aspects uh, of sustainability, whether that's uh, conversion into becoming a B Corp certified uh, wine company, uh, zero waste, uh, transition from growers from conventional uh, viticulture into sustainable viticulture, and more recently, uh, our move into regenerative farming, which uh, today is going to be uh, focused on. So yeah, looking forward to going through uh, some of the trial work we've been doing, and uh, also as we look forward to the future, kind of what we're what we're seeing. So yeah, in the, uh, the, <clears throat> over the next uh, hour, about 30 minutes, where we're going to be covering uh, really our expansion into regenerative organic viticulture. And this started three years ago uh, as a conversion plan at our Robert Hall Winery in Paso Robles, California, to really investigate uh, everything to do with regenerative organic farming. Uh, so this started with a 40-acre uh, conversion uh, three years ago, and now it's expanded into 130 acres. And so we're going to go through uh, those results and show you some of the kind of key learnings. We thought it was important to do this because if we uh, want to convert the rest of our vineyards, which now have conversion plans for the balance of the state vineyards, it makes up about 1,200 acres. And also, if we want to have these conversations with any of our growers, we felt like it was important to have that knowledge of the effect on our own land uh, that we can talk about and we can help our grower partners if they wish to go into regenerative farming, uh, what it's or what it's all about. So firstly, just an overarching uh, definition of regenerative organic viticulture, it really refers to this holistic and sustainable approach to grape cultivation for wine production, it's integrating organic farming principles with regenerative uh, practices this overarching aim to improve soil health, biodiversity, ecosystem resilience. And the goal is to really regenerate and restore uh, natural systems within and around the vineyard. So this slide here uh, is really kind of just painting the scene of the different types of farming uh, within uh, viticulture and also within kind of other systems uh, as well. Uh, at the bottom here, we've got regenerative uh, organic uh, farming here. Uh, so at uh, kind of the key pillars uh, around uh, eliminating herbicides, obviously we're growing organically, so it's like organics plus under a regenerative system, eliminating synthetic fungicides, uh, incorporation of animals uh, into the farming system. Uh, for us, we're using uh, sheep for weed control um, and also that nutrient uh, recycling for about five months a year. I'm originally from uh, New Zealand, so the accents, it's not from the south, uh, it's from south-south uh, of southern equator uh, down into New Zealand, so I could talk about sheep for the next hour if, you, if we wanted to, but uh, the next pillar of regenerative organic farming is around uh, tillage and minimizing timid tillage and, if possible, uh, eliminating it uh, altogether. Uh, the planting of cover crops is really important within the uh, regenerative framework. Um, and monitoring soil carbon levels, uh, which we're doing when we've got some great data to share with you on that from the uh, ecology team. Uh, incorporating the social fairness standard, which is uh, one of the key pillars of the regenerative organic uh, framework, which is really uh, inspiring, uh, we feel, around, to, around uh, worker fairness, uh, paying a living wage, incorporating uh, vineyard staff into the decision-making of uh, the operation. And then also uh, building uh, soil quality uh, with compost uh, compost ab applications on a regular basis. So those are the kind of key key pillars there and how they 
uh, differed to some of the other uh, farming systems. So the purpose of our uh, 40 acre trial was to really understand uh, regenerative farming, uh, the practices, uh, the effect on yield, quality, uh, costs, uh, and finished wine. So we're taking uh, fruit all the way through the finished wine uh, stage uh, so we can pair the sustainable farming control with the regenerative organic over a, uh, over a three year period. So the location and trial design. So we're in Paso Robles uh, in the Geneseo AVA. Uh, makes up uh, the total area is 48 acres, uh, 43 acres uh, converted to regenerative. And we've got some uh, biodynamic inputs that we've been incorporating as well. Then a five acre control growing under uh, sustainable wine growing, like standard, uh, standard system um, across all of our supply. So uh, over a thousand acres is all grown under uh, sustainable growing conditions at O'Neill. Then we've got 15,000 acres across 200 growers that are all growing under sustainable wine growing guidelines. And so the system that we're using for the five acres is in line with the industry kind of standard sustainable growing system. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon Clone 15 is the uh, variety, it's the most planted variety in, uh, in Paso Robles and then also in California, which is uh, the sole variety that we're focusing on in this trial. So here we are for those uh, that might not be familiar with Paso Robles, right in between uh, San Francisco and Los Angeles, about a four hour drive uh, each way. And then we are located, uh, the next slide, uh, right in the middle of Paso Robles. So Paso Robles is made up of 11 key AVAs, which are viticultural districts uh, that have been classified based on soil type and proximity to the ocean aspect. Um, and we're right here uh, in what we call the heart uh, of Paso. So this is a, a bird's eye view of the of the estate vineyard uh, at Robert Hall. So this is the uh, there's 60 acres here in total, and then we've got another uh, vineyard of another uh, 70 acres uh, in the Australia AVA that's also now in conversion to rege regenerative organic. Top left hand side here, we've got uh, the trial area uh, in the control sustainable control in the red. In the black, uh, this is where the uh, the regenerative organic area is in terms of where we're taking all the samples and data analysis. Um, and the rest of the block here uh, is all in conversion from 2021. So we're just finished our third year of uh, this transition. And then uh, in 2022, after we saw the results from 2021, we started uh, converting uh, the rest of this estate uh, surrounding the winery. So this is a kind of year behind in conversion. And then our Australia uh, estate vineyard and Paso Robles as well, that other 70 acres is in uh, conversion. It's in year two conversion to regenerative organic in line with this uh, second piece uh, as well. Uh, our partners, so we're working closely with the Riddell Institute, uh, Nathaniel Gonzalez Siemens uh, from uh, Riddell. Uh, is our uh, regenerative organic consultant. Uh, for those that you might not be familiar, uh, the Riddell Institute uh, is one of the founding uh, partners of the Regenerative uh, Organic Alliance that oversees the certification process for uh, regenerative organic uh, certified. Uh, then along the Riddell Institute, along with Patagonia and Dr. Broners were the kind of founding, founding members. And the Riddell Institute, they're based out of uh, Pennsylvania, they're the largest uh, organic and regenerative research uh, institute uh, anywhere in uh, North America. Philippe Armenier, uh, we've been working with uh, from a biodynamic perspective in terms of some of the biodynamic preps for inputs for soil and uh, canopy. So when we look at the two programs, it's a fairly a uh, standard sustainable program. Uh, we control, we're using herbicides, um, so Roundup, Rely, Pest Control, uh, Mealybug, uh, Leafhopper, Torex Moth are some of the key pests within uh, wine grapes. Um, these are mainly systemic uh, products that work kind of up and down uh, flow and, and xylem uh, within the vine to control, uh, control these pests. And then the fungicide program, it's a pretty standard um, sustainable uh, program for powdery mildew uh, control. Uh, this is a combination of sulfur and then also systemic products that protect uh, the fruit from powdery mildew. And then a nutri nutrition program, zinc, calcium, uh, phosphate. Now this compares to 
uh, regenerative organic program on the next slide. Uh, weed control, we are uh, using a Clemens undervine uh, weeder, which is a kind of small little blade that tills weeds just under the vine. Um, there's also an attachment, like a, a disc that mounts up. So we've got this like berm for the uh, weed knife to kind of work through. Uh, permanent cover crop from year two onwards, uh, we were doing it in year one, like an early till uh, right at the start of the season. We've kind of moved, to, well, we have moved away from that practice completely of any mid-row till. Uh, we're starting to see some effects of like erosion and we weren't happy about. So permanent cover crop uh, all year round in the uh, in the mid-row. Pest control. Uh, so when you start farming uh, under a regenerative organic or organic uh, system, you haven't got those synthetic tools. And so we've moved to a completely 100% biocontrol program for our pest control. And we'll show you a little bit about what we're doing there in regards to utilization of mealybug destroyer. Fungicide program, really uh, sulfur is the main uh, product here that we're using, has been used for thousands of years uh, for powdery mildew control. Uh, so we're getting really good control with powdery mildew with uh, really just using that from a fungicide perspective. And nutrition, uh, base compost application is six tons to the acre uh, annually broadcast spread. So we're really focusing on trying to increase our, our organic matter and really focusing on building uh, building our soils. And then a combination of different uh, biodynamic products and organic products uh, throughout the seal to boost kind of vine health um, throughout the season. Next slide. So we'll just see if this video clip can play here, Holly. So this is a broadcast spread uh, of uh, compost being applied at uh, six uh, six tons to the acre. Um, so this is a complete yeah broadcast spreads covering like two and a half rows uh, at a um, at a time. Might better just click the side arrow there, Holly. Maybe. Um, it looks like the uh, little bar is covering up the play button. Oh, unfortunate. Okay. It's all it's all good. Um, but yeah, all organically certified compost uh, obviously needs to be um, applied uh, to the vin uh, to the vineyard as well. So we're doing broadcast because we feel like we've got to build the whole uh, soil uh, profile, not just the kind of banded area um, under the vine. We can move to the next slide, Holly. Uh, in the spring, uh, barrel compound. Uh, this is a, one of the butter preparations where this is uh, preparing here um, on. Uh, on site uh, before being applied uh, into the vineyard. Also early spring, putting our cover crops in, um, primarily using annual cover crops we have in the last uh, two years. We are moving towards designing a cover crop for Paso Robles uh, with um, some uh, experts in that field, designing a cover crop that's 15 to 20 species. Um, that's perennial, uh, native, uh, kind of low growing, uh, flowers at different times that adds a lot of diversity to the vineyard. Uh, so we're in process of uh, identified those 15 uh, species and we're uh, putting that blend together at the moment, but uh, hopefully getting seeded relatively soon for the spring. And uh, obviously some undefined weed control uh, in the spring there as well. We go to the next slide. So this is the uh, annual cover crop, uh, legumes, barley, um, uh, clover, uh, phacelia, um, some buckwheat, uh, all being all being applied um, and uh, drilled in. Uh, what's difficult with Paso Robles is that it just gets so warm that come uh, early midsummer, this is like they're kind of self self terminating. We've let it self terminate, which is why we've got this kind of quest to develop uh, more of a native perennial based cover crop that gives us full uh, protection of uh, ground cover uh, throughout the year. And we're certainly seeing the benefits of a protected ground cover when we have it, um, of protecting the soil, at lower soil temperatures, holding more moisture. And we kind of think this is critical for uh, kind of a long-term for growing in Paso Robles. Next slide. 
I was hoping these would uh, these ones might work, Holly. But this is uh, an example of uh, biocontrol uh, in the vineyard here. Uh, so this on the left here is uh, mealybug destroyer uh, being applied into the uh, into the drone here. So uh, this is an insectary that is uh, incubating uh, any uh, basically predator of a common pest in agriculture and they're breeding them uh, and then we're partnering with UAV IQ uh, and their drone basically technology uh, to basically take the mealybug destroyer up and actually start deploying them uh, on a flight path out across the vineyard. So we do our monitoring uh, for mealybug uh, and then based on our monitoring levels, we will adjust uh, the rate of application of the mealybug destroyer, um, whether that's as low as 500 uh, per acre or up to like 2000 per acre, depending on the density of mealybug. And the beauty of this technology is that we can uh, drop uh, the mealybug destroyer, the predator, uh, based on hotspots, based on um, just a, a general like uh, application to just build a baseline population or really target specific areas where we uh, might be having problems. Um, but I'm sure you've all seen a drone drone fly that basically goes up and down the vineyards with about a, a 30 feet uh, swath uh, dropping uh, the mealybug destroyer out here. And go to the next next slide. This is a, a example of uh, undermine cultivation. So this is a Clemens unit. Um, uh, again, like working working through the vineyard uh, vineyard here. Uh, these little blades that uh, basically just lightly till under under the vine um, to just reduce that competition with weeds uh, under the vine, uh, and then the rest of the area is permanent. Uh, cover crop sward throughout the throughout the season. Um, under the regenerative organic framework, you can still uh, till that under uh, under vine area. Obviously, the holy grail at the gold standard of the regenerative organic framework is uh, a, a no till a no till system. Yeah, but at this stage, we're still doing that small till area just underneath the vine, which is probably still leaves about seventy to eighty percent of the area total area under. Uh, permanent cover. Uh, we are applying some of the other biodynamic preps throughout the uh, throughout the season um, to build. Uh, really, these are canopy based uh, products to help build resilience uh, in the uh, in the grapevine. Go to the next slide. So going. So this is the first uh, first year pre harvest um, comparison. So we go through the spring summer. So we've got these full kind of canopies growing. So we've got this sustainable control uh, on the left. So this is when we were doing that early uh, early till in the mid row, which we've now moved uh, away from. Um, definitely saw a, a bigger response. So a bigger canopy, uh, denser canopy, like a kind of darker green leaf. And what we saw throughout uh, is that if those of that you are familiar with passerobals, it gets really hot here, yeah, particularly in the summer. And so on the left-hand side, uh, we had in the control, the fruit was more exposed to the sun. So we had more crinkling and dehydration of the skins comparatively to the regenerative organic side. It was like we just had the bigger umbrellas over the fruit. And so an analogy would be like if, you were, if we as humans were out standing in direct sunlight for nine months, our skin's probably going to be a little burnt and kind of dehydrated as well comparatively to being out there with an umbrella. And so we saw that come through uh, in regards to uh, yield uh, I think, uh, on the next couple of slides, but we'll just show you in the 2022 comparison as well, uh, seeing uh, next growing season, um, you've got the permanent cover crop down there, as you'll see. Um, as you see, it's self-terminated. We just let it uh, basically self-terminate. Self um, but again, like big difference in uh, the, the size of the canopy there. And um, what that's leading to is when the fruit comes into the winery, uh, the fruit's in better condition and less dimpling and dehydration and shrivel, which can lead to kind of overripe uh, characters and also less yield, uh, a juice yield. So even though bunch numbers uh, are the same between the two systems, the amount of juice and kind of uh, size of berry as a result uh, was 
uh, higher in their regenerative site compared to the uh, sustainable control. And going into yeah pre-harvest, so this is like right uh, right before harvest uh, here uh, as well, kind of same the same thing, pretty consistent uh, through the uh, through the system, and uh, again just that protection of the fruit in this hot dry climate uh, really helping keep fruit quality uh, in terms of the skins and in, uh, intact. So how did what did this all shake out in regards to yield? So in uh, 2021, if you look on the left hand side, so control on the left, uh, regenerative on the right. So what we're uh, seeing here, uh, again, bunch numbers were the same, uh, but this is a pure uh, protection of fruit as what we believe is happening here. So this was I think it was like 14% increase in yield and uh, tons uh, tons per acre. In 2022, it was one of the driest seasons uh, on, on record. Uh, a small kind of yield increase, but only, uh, I think it was like 3%. Uh, but overall, like a, a pretty positive uh, result uh, in this uh, two years of data that we've uh, collected. We've just been through the third season, just finished harvest. So we've got a whole lot of other data that um, uh, will be coming through uh, shortly, but yeah, certainly the juice the the juice yields uh, were uh, were higher. At brick, so this is the sugar content of fruit uh, as it comes uh, uh, in, into the winery. Uh, so as you'd expect, a slightly lower bricks level, which is going to be slightly less uh, alcohol. Um, there's a direct correlation generally between yield uh, yield and sugar. All these blocks were picked on the same day as well for uh, anyone uh, curious about uh, that. And we thought that was important from a uh, just keeping everything as consistent as possible. Uh, it could be an argument um, and some have made, well, you could have left the regenerative on the vine for another week. But honestly, we're very happy with this level of uh, ripeness uh, within the control and the regenerative, which is why we picked on the same day. A uh, yan level, so yeast available nitrogen. So this is a, a, a sign of the health of the ferment. Uh, uh, nitrogen's uh, an important part of the ferment in regards to converting uh, sugars into alcohol. And so basically the higher the number, uh, the better the quality of the juice and the nutrition of the, uh, of the ferment. Uh, pretty similar in years, uh, years one uh, in 2021, we're going to 2022, we've had a, a, a pretty sizable increase uh, incre increase here. Uh, going to color. So again, uh, from a winemaking perspective, color uh, is also uh, uh, a measure of uh, of quality, or well, one of the measures of quality that's often used in wine grapes. So in the sustainable control, uh, there was uh, more more color in 20 slightly more color in 2021. I mean, when you look at the uh, wines, honestly, it's they're still very, very dark, deep, almost black wines, but more color in 2021 in the control compared to the regenerative side. And then 2022, uh, in the next slide, uh, kind of more on more on par here, color uh, color wise. Yeah. Um, if not like a kind of slight uh, slight increase uh, on the regenerative side. Not completely sure kind of what's kind of going on here. So we're pretty interested to see the results from this year's harvest and see how this um, uh, translates. Um, it definitely was not a sample swap uh, here. I was, it was my first question is, did we just get this around the wrong wrong way? Was it a lab error? But it uh, was definitely, definitely wasn't. Uh, so cost, so this is, uh, for any business, uh, uh, cost is an important part of uh, farming and any type of transition. You want to have a pretty good idea of the uh, effect on farming costs and the effect on yield because that drives uh, profitability for any agricultural business. So 2021, uh, we're 4.83 tonnes per the acre uh, of fruit in the uh, in 21 and the regenerative control side and uh, the sustainable control. In the regenerative side, uh, in 21, with 5.52 tons. 
cost per acre of farming is uh, is more expensive. Uh, we found it's about 10% more expensive. The big drivers of that uh, weed control with the undivine uh, cultivation is definitely slower than herbiciding and it doesn't last as long. So you're doing more passes. Uh, so we're doing like three passes of, uh, three or four passes and four passes of undivine tillage under the vine uh, compared to two herbicides a year. Also at this stage, uh, biocontrol uh, through drones is more expensive than uh, systemic uh, insecticides as well. So those were the two real main drivers uh, of the cost increases. But when we translate that to uh, the, the yield piece um, in terms of the kind of higher juice yields coming in uh, from the regenerative side, it actually translated to a 3% decrease per ton of fruit produced. Now, when we go into 2022, uh, yield is pretty much the same here. Um, our farming got a little bit more uh, efficient, 9% uh, increase uh, per acre, and generally we're getting better at uh, our farming techniques. Um, so uh, this is coming coming down. Um, that massive difference in cost per ton just shows you how yield drives uh, uh, economic performance of a vineyard. And 2022, uh, transfer to the winery a 6% increase in, um, in the price per ton of fruit grown under a regenerative system compared to the control. Kane, I know 2023 just ended, but do you have any preliminary numbers um, just in terms of yield? Um, yeah, just kind of continuing that on. Do you have we're, any idea where you're going to land? We're kind of pulling like all of that together at the moment, all the color data, yield data, cost data, um, so yeah, two like we like, literally just finished harvest like a week ago. Um, yeah, I know so it's a little first, a little too it, soon. Pulling it all together, but yeah, we'll have an update here in the coming months on uh, on year three. Got it. Um, so in twenty twenty three, we started uh, the partnership with uh, Agrology, and the purpose is to really quantify uh, with data. Uh, the differences between uh, sustainable and regenerative system, or really what is happening with soil moisture, uh, CO2 in the canopy, carbon concentrations in soil, ground temperature. And we found they had some really interesting uh, technology through sensors um, that we installed uh, in the vineyard in 2023. I wish I had heard of them or if they had been around in 2021. Honestly, it would have been cool to have this right from the start, but um, We've uh, got data for 2023, which uh, uh, we're going to share with you here. And uh, Charlie here is going to just help me kind of explain what's going on here. But on the top left of this is the uh, one of the agrology sensors. And I'll let Charlie kind of explain kind of what's going on here in regards to uh, measurements and take a sip of water. Yeah, thanks, Kane. And thanks for showing all, uh, all that so far. Um, so we created this infographic just to kind of try to explain how the agrology sensor um, is monitoring changes in soil carbon stocks, but it's also monitoring changes in microbial activity. So where I like to kind of start explaining the, um, the, the infographic is right underneath the plant there. We have three different arrows going into the soil microbiome. And those are all to, to, to kind of indicate that there's different practice changes that a grower might be um, might be doing. So, you know, a biological inoculant, the one of the many thousands of different um, biologic products that are currently available. Um, they might be doing cover crop or reducing tillage, and that's going to increase the, the number of live roots that are in the microbiome. And these roots are actually feeding the microbiome through plant exudates. Um, forget the exact number, but I believe it's around half or up to 50% of the energy that a plant is converting uh, from sunlight is actually given to the microbiome as a sort of synergistic exchange for nutrients. Um, you also could be you know, applying manure and compost, but all of these things are gonna be modulating microbial activity. And really with the goal of increasing microbial activity, uh, re increasing microbial diversity, and just making the whole soil system more healthy and robust, that is gonna result in the carbon cycle turning over more quickly. Just like if you were exercising a lot and you had a really healthy diet, you're gonna have a quicker and stronger metabolism. 
And that's really what the Arbiter system is picking up on. We are monitoring carbon respiration. And uh, carbon respiration is the carbon dioxide that is being released from the soil microbiome. It goes up through the pores, and then we see that as different concentrations. Uh, we actually monitor uh, CO2 concentrations in three different places. We monitor it directly coming out of the soil with a soil chamber. Um, so that soil chamber looks like this, and it sits kind of right at the surface of the soil. And that is the most sensitive part because uh, we're not getting wind, we're not getting mixing. It's, it's really just looking at the CO2 concentration directly kind of in and above the soil. And then we also have a CO2 sensor that is getting background, kind of atmospheric CO2 levels. And then we also have one that goes directly into the canopy and that's this highest one. And the goal there is so that we can actually see the, this carbon dioxide that's going into the canopy and then getting brought back down into the soil system. What's really exciting about this is that we can not only get carbon sequestration numbers by monitoring this, we, we get a baseline of the carbon stocks in the soil and then um, we can you know, basically tabulate throughout the year how much carbon dioxide is either coming into the system or leaving the system. Um, but we can also monitor uh, all these other really important secondary effects of having a very active soil microbiome. And uh, we've actually seen a lot of these, we'll show this in, in data in the next few slides, but um, with an increase in microbial activity and microbial diversity, you know, we're gonna be seeing improved soil structure, uh, increased pore space, which is gonna help increase water infiltration. So when you are irrigating or there are rains, the water's actually going into the soil as opposed to pooling or running off into the ditches. Uh, we're also gonna see increased water retention because of that increase in soil organic uh, matter. Uh, we're also gonna be seeing increased nutrient cycling. Um, this is a huge one for, for vineyards and for produce growers and for really any farmer. Um, if we can get the biological system to function better, we're actually gonna be saving on fertilizer costs because the nutrients that are in the soil are gonna be made plant available through that nutrient cycling which is why the cover crop and the cash crop are actually giving those exudates to the soil microbiome. That's the exchange. They're giving these sugars in exchange for, for this nutrient cycling. Um, we're also gonna be seeing increased pest and disease and stress resistance. And what's most interesting there is, there's a lot of different studies that have shown this, but you get increased pest resistance with a stronger soil microbiome. And that's actually the same secondary plant metabolites that are often associated with quality and nutrient density. These are the compounds that actually make food medicine. So these are things like, um, they're, they're generally called phytonutrients, but uh, you know, tannins, um, bioflavonoids, uh, phenols, kind of all, there's a, there's a whole mix of them. But these are all secondary plant metabolites or these things that plants create in order to shore up their defenses against pest and disease. And it turns out they're also really good for wine quality and they're really good for human health. And then of course, you know, there's a lot of interest in um, carbon and carbon farming and climate smart farming. And so we're also monitoring carbon sequestration, um, which is also a, you know, a key part of this soil microbiome. Again, carbon is kind of the key ingredient of life. Um, so that's, that's how we monitor the system. And that's generally kind of how the Arbiter system works. I'll pass it back to you, Kane. All right. So within, thanks for the explanation. So the, here uh, we have the sensors set up in the uh, control and the regenerative side uh, of the trial here. Uh, so what we're looking at here is that soil chamber. Uh, we're looking at uh, carbon concentrations uh, within that chamber within the soil. So the key to look at here, row 10 uh, is the control, uh, the little green box there and row 40 uh, is the regenerative side, the little yellow orange uh, orange box there. So we've got a, a significant higher level of uh, CO2 uh, being stored within that uh, within that chamber, which uh, which is an exciting result. Um, again, this is just uh, just year one effectively, uh, even though it's at the third year of the trial. So we're looking forward to seeing how this uh, changes uh, over time. Uh, the beauty of this data is that it's being kind of collected like all the time in real time as well. So we can start to see changes uh, throughout uh, the season uh, and over time as well. So uh, we'll be monitoring this pretty, pretty closely, which, uh, yeah, we're excited about. Can, can I jump into on this one? Yeah. Um, so I think just one thing that's important to highlight is 
you could look at this and you could say, okay, the regenerative is the gold, but doesn't that mean that there's actually more carbon being emitted out into the atmosphere? Um, and although that is true on one side, there's actually uh, soils with more respiration are healthier soils that sequester more carbon. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but it's kind of the same thing as if, you know, if I was going for a run versus just sitting on the couch and you took the CO2 that I was respiring, um, I'm going to have a lot more if I'm exercising and healthy. And so if there's more respiration, that's indicative of a, a higher metabolic rate of the carbon cycle, which is also putting uh, carbon into that, that long-term storage, that humic fraction, um, which is called you know, carbon sequestration, which is really one of the big things we're going after here. So even though it seems counterintuitive and it looks like you know, there's, there is more respiration, that's actually a good thing. And that's a sign of a healthier soil system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. And we got the next slide here. So this is, uh, again, comparing control and the regenerative. Uh, this is CO2 concentration within the, within the canopy. So again, row 10, uh, the control, row 40, the regenerative side. And this is, uh, as you'd expect, uh, so the blue box there, 399, uh, higher CO2 concentrations in the canopy, uh, slightly higher uh, compared to the uh, regenerative side on row 40 there at, at 370. Uh, so kind of backing up the data from that, uh, that first slide. Uh, any other comments here, Charlie? No, I think you nailed it. You know, we're consistently seeing um, more CO2 being taken in by the regenerative rows um, and bringing that CO2 down into the soil system. So the next piece here that the sensors are measuring uh, water holding capacity of the soil. Uh, so again, row 10, the control uh, in the blue, regenerative blue, uh, row 40 in the green there. We're holding more uh, water in the, uh, in the soils. So I think that's a combination of uh, cover crop, uh, the composting we've been doing, uh, building a healthier soil where we're holding more moisture. And I think that's contributing to the canopy size difference and kind of just health of the vine as well, being another uh, kind of variable that is showing through uh, in regards to what's happening kind of uh, above ground here. Any other comments there, Charlie? No, no, you nailed it. Uh, and that correlates here uh, with uh, ground uh, ground temperature here. So this is uh, this is the air temperature uh, on the ground, right, Charlie? Row ten and row row forty. This is actually so, in the canopy. So this oh, is this what is the, the grapes are feeling. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, uh, correlates with the previous three slides, uh, it's kind of warmer uh, in around the canopy in the control, uh, pretty significantly uh, compared to row 40, uh, where it's slightly, slightly cooler. Um, yeah, I think one thing that was, oh, sorry, can you uh, go ahead. I think, again, that a larger canopy uh, is kind of contributing to kind of more shade there as well. So it's giving kind of more, uh, more protection. But again, the beauty of this data, we can see the effect, which would actually be interesting, like early, this is look where this was collected at 10 past five. So at um, this shot here, um, it's pretty, still pretty warm, really hot in Paso, obviously uh, at this time, still a lot of sun exposure, the sun's still uh, high this time of year and um, capturing this type of data um, early in the morning as well. Um, but again, the beauty of this data is that it's got a real time and with this data, we'll better do some pretty interesting modeling in the future once we, uh, just get more data over time. Yeah. So agrology, one of the things we do is tabulate, you know, the total number of days over 90 degrees and over 100 degrees. And I remember from this particular block, I believe that the regenerative had, I think it was like 40 or 50 less days over 100. So it really made that difference. And that's really one of those critical thresholds, mm -hmm. um, you know, for grapes, 100 and obviously 105 is another really critical one. But yeah, we even those kind of, you know, not huge differences, only I guess in this case, seven or eight degrees, uh, it really made a big difference in terms of keeping those grapes from going over those critical heat thresholds where you're starting to see shriveling and, and damage. Yeah, and then from a, a quality perspective, uh, what we've seen in wine all through, not just Paso Robles, all through California, when it does get, the fruit does get overly hot, those 
dehydration, uh, it does, uh, you're losing weight, so you're losing yield, but then also you're getting these kind of overripe kind of characters as well and higher, artificially higher alcohols uh, as a result, which is not what not what we're after. So this is kind of, kind of showing with data uh, the effect of healthy soil, I think, a bigger canopy, providing more shade protection through cover crop and a larger canopy to help lower some of those uh, temperatures. And when we look to the future of kind of wine growing in Paso in a warm climate, uh, these are all uh, interesting uh, observations and like effects um, that have us kind of excited about this form of farming kind of going forward in a uh, forever warming climate, it seems. Uh, so next steps for us, so we started off with the 40 acres. We've got um, all 130 acres uh, in, in Paso in conversion. We've also got some other large vineyards in the Central Valley uh, and up in Clarksburg. Some of those are young, super young, like just replanted uh, vineyards like in Clarksburg, but all of these vineyards have regenerative organic uh, conversion plans uh, based on the results that we've achieved uh, and we're seeing so far. Uh, CCOF and ROS certification for the first uh, 40 acres. Uh, we've got an audit uh, next week for the, those first um, 40 acres. And then year two, uh, so this time next year, the balance of the estate will fall into uh, certification. Uh, we've decided internally, um, and Jeff O'Neill, a huge shout out and thank you to him, our visionary fearless leader for really supporting this uh, uh, firstly, trial and now expansion um, uh, into uh, regenerative organics. So the trial will continue. Uh, we'll just we're just going to keep continuing because we think it's important to uh, capture this data uh, not only for um, ourselves but for industry and also our growers that might be considering uh, a move into regenerative organic or even just adopting some of the practices from a regenerative system into their uh, sustainable systems. And just, yeah, before we jump into Q&A, just none of this would uh, ha happen uh, without the support, obviously, of Jeff O'Neill, our owner, Matt Towers, our chief operating officer, Kirk Brown, Ted Moore, Sam Horn from Grow, Relation, Grow Late Relations, Alyssa Hall, our sustainability manager, and then our winemakers, Don Brady uh, and Amanda Gorder. So uh, thank you to all of them and uh, helping uh, make these transitions. So yeah. Questions and answers. We'd be ha uh, happy to answer some questions, Charlie. All right, let's jump in. We'll start with, um, I'm just going to kind of go up here and see. Okay, so we got one from Martin, our friend uh, from Union Grove. Um, and he was wondering, did you measure vegetative bricks? No, no. We, no, we probably should. Um, that's a good, good call out. That would be. Yeah. Yeah. I assume that's sort of kind of in line with SAP analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That would be really interesting. I'll make a note of that and we can definitely do that, do that next year. Yeah. Um, and then there's another question from Chris. Um, did you study the impact or changes in soil biology, uh, initial fungal and bacterial counts of functional groups? And what was the composition of the compost application? Um, First part of that, uh, no, uh, we haven't. We have been uh, talking to Cal Poly uh, about doing some of that work going into year year four going forward since we've still got the um, control in place. And after three years of regenerative growing, we think that is a kind of important piece of it. Um, the compost, uh, so there's a question uh, from Hayden as well. Um, the compost is all purchased compost, organic compost from uh, off-site. It's a combination of uh, manure, green material, um, some uh, uh, mark from the winery uh, as well. Uh, some of the biodynamic preps put into the compost uh, making as well. Um, but yeah, it's an organically certified compost. But as much as we'd like to make it on site, we're just not set up for making compost on site at the moment. All right. And then we got a question from Lucas about um, the potentially crimping cover crop. Would that lead to more ground cover over the summer rather than um, the mowing or, um, yeah, no, or, yeah. or even sheep? 
Yeah, yeah. Thank you for mentioning it. That's something that uh, just started to look in, look into. I think there's a lot of opportunity with crimping. Uh, haven't really seen it in in practice here in Paso Robles, but with the new cover crop that we're developing, that is the intent to uh, grow it uh, and then to crimp it uh, at the start of summer to kind of like lay it down and protect the protect mm -hmm. the soils because it's probably not going to survive completely all the way through. But to be able to protect that soil, we're seeing uh, when we do have permanent cover, we're holding more moisture, we're irrigating less, which is really counterintuitive to the kind of traditional thought of anything growing in the mid rows, kind of contributing to taking water where I think we're starting to see that if you've got that permanent cover and you can keep it, soil temperatures are lower and as a result, you're holding kind of more moisture. Mm -hmm. And then a follow-up question to that, I know you mentioned, so currently you're using, you know, you're doing um, under row tillage, so in the vine row. Have you, are you experimenting? Are you thinking about potentially experimenting with um, completely no-till, you know, leaving the cover crop underneath uh, to auto-terminate? Yeah, so we've got a, 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 a research grant that we've uh, submitted uh, with uh, the CAP Collective here in Paso and then also in uh, collaboration with the Rodal Institute, looking at cover crops in the mid row, and then also uh, low growing cover crop, or low growing crops under the vine, so uh, tillage could be completely uh, removed away from. Uh, yeah. So th there's a number of different kind of clover, lysim, low growing other species that have been kind of mm -hmm. identified for uh, for that trial trial work. So we yeah, definitely think that's interesting. There has been some uh, work done in this regard and other wine growing regions that has pointed to like a yield uh, yield reduction. So we're going to monitor, yeah, feel like it's important. Keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on it and do the trial work and and uh, see what see what happens. Our cordon heights are pretty high here at, uh, at the winery, um, which allows us to graze for kind of a longer longer period than most. Uh, but that is certainly something of interest as well as uh, architecture set up of the vine, um, maybe uh, smaller sheep uh, as well uh, in regards to uh, longer term grazing uh, under, under vine, because that would solve you know, all problems if you could just graze all year round. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think and like you mentioned, you could save a lot of money in the labor of going through and uh, you know doing the the multiple passes of, of yeah. mechanical weeding there. Completely, and then you've got that year round uh, nutrient recycling of it all uh, as well. And then you look at the cost side. The biggest barrier here is um, is just that undermined cultivation work in regards to needing the equipment. Uh, we using a farm management company, so. It's their equipment at this stage, uh, but just the additional passes comparatively to herbiciding um, mm -hmm. is is more costly. So that could be a way to alleviate uh, some of those um, some of those costs. Yeah. Okay. Now we have a question from Erica. Um, how accepted is this method for measuring carbon sequestration, and is there a standard that it corresponds to? Um, I can kind of answer that. Um, Charlie, I'm also happy to if you want me to. Oh, perfect. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess first off, Adam, do you want to talk about how we chatted with um, with Robert Hall, you know, the, um, the yeah, consultant the that back. they brought in? Perfect. Yeah. And so uh, just to introduce myself real quick, my name is Adam Keppel. I'm uh, woefully unprepared to be on camera, I just realized. So please pardon my appearance. Uh, hopefully you haven't switched over to my view. But uh, I want to uh, first say that I'm one of the founders of Agrology and the CEO. And it's been a real pleasure working with Kane and Robert Hall on this project and just seeing some of the dramatic data that they've produced and the results that you can see. It's amazing to find a project where you can both see the the change with your bare eyes in, in the canopy and also see it so clearly in the data. It's, it's fantastic. And so when we first engaged with Robert Hall, one of their questions was, will this be accepted by our carbon auditors? And of course, their goal is, uh, you know, to have a, a positive impact and to uh, achieve positive impact through their own on-site agricultural practices. And so we engaged with their uh, carbon consultants and their carbon auditors to talk about our methodology and the way our technology works. And the answer there was for insetting, you know, the fact that we were going to work with Robert Hall on actual ground truth measurement of their uh, changes. Uh, there was an unequivocal yes, we'll accept that. Because the thing to remember is that for most of the carbon credit industry, there is no measurement. 
Uh, there is just estimates based on practice changes. And so when you step into a room where everyone's kind of guesstimating what's happening and you have hard data, you're always going to win. Uh, and so that's the kind of the first level answer there that for incident programs, absolutely. Uh, on the second, which is, you know, is there a methodology around this? Uh, there's not a specific methodology for this kind of technology because there has to still be a process of, you know, what is additionality? What is the change that's happening? Um, here, of course, we're measuring their control and their trial. So we get that. Uh, in other scenarios, we're working with carbon registries to establish a methodology based on ground truth measurement now, which we believe is going to lead to much, much higher quality carbon insets or carbon offsets. And we're also working with multiple customers on that. But what I'd emphasize, you know, especially in the viticulture sector and the wine grape sector, is that you know, the value of your carbon benefits, you're going to realize them, you know, I think most powerfully through a more cost effective crop. As, uh, as Kane has just explained to us so thoroughly with those numbers, but also through the, um, the branding of the product, not through selling in carbon markets. And since that is effectively an insetting approach, you know that we can work with anyone's carbon auditors and their carbon consultants to explain this process and get it accepted. So I hope that answers that question there. And if anybody has any follow-ups on it, I'd be happy to answer them. If there are any follow-ups, you can put them in the chat or just jump in. Um, but yeah, I'll move on to the next question. Um, Ryan, actually, and this might be another one for, for you, Adam, um, or in conjunction with Kane. Uh, Ryan Scott asked, how many sensors are deployed in the trial and are these results statistically significant? Um, so I can say that uh, we did two sensors um, in this uh, in this first you know trial block, really, um, you know, kind of as an initial engagement um, as a trial for um, Robert Hall as well. Um, you know, we're in conversations about expanding that. In terms of statistical significance, uh, I would say probably not enough to publish a peer-reviewed paper, uh, but that's definitely something, you know, we're pursuing in other, um, in other vineyards and kind of in other research that we're doing. We're working with uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, UC Davis, um, a variety of uh, Climate Smart Commodities grants. So there will be research coming um, out on this method. Um, but yeah, in terms of statistical significance for this, I think that the data was really, really clear. Like it was pretty night and day. Uh, that I, also it's important to highlight. You know, this is the same block, the same varietal, the same soil. Um, the only difference were these practice changes. So um, statistical significance uh, in terms of you know publishing a paper, uh, I'd, I'd say we would need many more sensors than we had. But mm -hmm. in terms of clear evidence that I mean, I don't want to speak again for Kane. I'll let Kane jump in. But in terms of like clear evidence, I'd say that the data speaks for itself. Yeah, I mean, we tried to reduce as many variables as possible. I mean, the, the land's been M38 mapped. So uh, we're pretty confident that the soil type is the same um, uh, in the trial, in the control, and the regenerative side. Um, but uh, definitely looking to add more uh, sensors next year, just to add more, add more data. Okay, let's see what other questions we've got. Um, uh, okay, so Gina Colfer, another good friend of agrology, asked, "Well, um, you may have mentioned, but what type of cover crops left the best residue or soil cover over the summer?" Um, and she also asked, "How do you manage rodents?" Yeah, so uh, cover crops really, uh, we haven't, like, in inverted commas, kind of commercially got easy options that are really well set up, in my opinion, for uh, best use within our vineyards here. So they're very much kind of annual based uh, cover crops, oats, legumes, um, annual species that um, kind of die off in the, in the summer period. Uh, we are looking at, and we are working with four scientists to develop a, a cover crop for passerobals. Like I mentioned, those 15 to 20 different species uh, that are long, longer living, native, um, and grow through a longer period using less uh, water as well. And then the rodent, uh, the rodent piece, uh, it's a challenge, uh, challenge for us all. I mean, we've got uh, our and wrap the boxes all around the property that kind of do the best we best we can, um, but yeah. Apart from that, where yeah we battle gophers and squirrels and 
uh, like uh, like everyone everyone else does as well. But honestly, it's no better or worse anywhere uh, within the within the blocks. Awesome. Um, we have a question from Steve, and then we have a lot of questions coming in. So pardon if I miss one, and if I do, just feel free to repost it. Um, but he asks, has Robert Hall received regenerative certification? And I would add on top of that, um, I know you guys are in the process of, you know, with uh, the ROC, the regenerative organic mm -hmm. certification. What yeah. made you choose that certification versus, you know, the myriad of other certifying bodies that are out there? Yeah, first, yeah, we feel that ROC is kind of like the gold standard of the regenerative organic kind of movement. Uh, they've been very proactive. Uh, the early case study, uh, pilot study uh, with Tablas Creek, uh, another winery here in uh, Paso Robles, who kind of been leading this charge for a, a long time. We felt uh, the ROC was the logical path to go. Um, we are going through the certification process at the moment, like right from the start of this, the whole idea was to really set this up as a, a transition trial from sustainable farming into CCOF and regenerative uh, organic farming. The beauty of uh, CCOF is that they uh, there's a relationship with the ROA uh, as well, so they can audit uh, for both under an organic system and a regenerative organic system. Um, so we've got our uh, CCOF audit uh, next next week to audit the last uh, three years. And then after that, uh, they'll audit for uh, ROC as well. Amazing. All right. Um, so there's some good talk in the chat about the resolution for sensors. Looks like Adam has that pretty well answered. But, you know, roughly we're looking at... Um, 60 to 80 acres kind of on these bigger block types. Uh, so avocados, tree nuts, that kind of thing. Um, in a state wine grapes, we're in that, you know, 30 to 50 acre range per device. Another thing that's important to um, emphasize is that carbon and microbial activity are very, um, they are very variable both in space and time. And so this sensor is really good at dealing with both of those challenges. Uh, that's one of the challenges from taking just soil samples is that you're, it's just a point in time, but it varies quite a bit throughout the year. So um, through, can take, through taking continuous data streams, that's how we deal with the temporal variability of carbon. And then for spatial variability, these sensors are really easy to move around. Um, and so we, we often work with clients and kind of make a plan in order to move them around a certain amount to create a certain statistical accuracy uh, with with the the data that we're gathering. Um, uh, so there was a question in regards to uh, sheep there from Hayden. So we're incorporating sheep uh, basically at the tail end uh, of the season. So as soon as the fruit's off, sheep come in for grazing. Uh, we're going to like block grazing. So we go block, block by block. Uh, we haven't got our own herd, uh, like, like Tablas Creek, for example, have their own herd and they've got their own shepherd, which is amazing. Um, everything they're doing is amazing. Um, but we're using uh, uh, outside farming partner uh, to move sheep uh, through the vineyard right from post-harvest all the way through to really early spring. So it's a kind of like five, six month period. Interesting. Okay, so it is the top of the hour. So just anyone who does have to jump, um, thanks so much for joining us. We will send a follow-up email. There will be future webinars, um, so you'll get the invite for that, but we'll send out the presentation slides uh, as well as the recording. But for anyone else who doesn't have another meeting or thing to jump to, um, Kane, if it's okay, maybe we can stick around for a few more minutes and just yeah. finish up these, cool. these last yeah. questions. Yeah. Awesome, so we got a question from Casey about, um, do you have severe mealybug problem? And if so, does the mealybug destroyer really keep them at bay, um, i.e. getting to the fruit? Yeah, another great, great question. So we've been lucky that we haven't historically had a mealybug uh, issue at the winery. Um, so we've got monitoring data going back like a long time and it's never really been an issue for us. So we've got a like fairly low baseline population. So when we uh, historically, we've been doing a couple of insecticides uh, a year, two to three, which has continued into the uh, control side. Uh, but the rest of the estate uh, is all been done with uh, these predator drops with the mealybug destroyer twice, if not three times a year. Uh, very much a kind of baseline uh, 
drops, so we've got a lower lower numbers of the predator. But um, what we're seeing is we're not seeing any number count differences between um, between the control and the regenerative side. Again, with biocontrol, it's a little uh, challenging because those metabolic destroyer could go across into the control. We don't we can't kind of track where they where they go. Um, but we're certainly not seeing any spikes in the regenerative side comparatively to the control. Great. Um, Brent was asking if we can bring up the slide that shows the difference in inputs and practices between the two blocks. Um, and then he also was asking, do, do you have a feeling of what changes kind of had the biggest impact? Um, so maybe Kane, you could just highlight kind of the biggest practice changes um, yeah. as Holly gets yeah, sure. that pulled up. Um, uh, yeah, the biggest practice changes are really, um, really instead of uh, herbiciding, uh, the undivine, uh, undivine cultivation. It might have been the next slide, I think, Holly, the um, of the sustainable program and the regenerative program, I think. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then, yeah. So it looks like herbicides uh, for weed control and then some synthetic chemistries for pest control. Yeah. Um, on the fungicide side. Uh, fungicide, yeah. Um, also yeah, some synthetics. Uh, yeah, some yeah some, some th synthetics um, in regards to uh, fungicides. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then from the uh, regenerative side, uh, lime sulfur, you know, early, early when the buds are just pushing, um, and then sulfur, uh, primarily for powdery mildew control. Uh, uh, crop oil is like a Janus stylet oil that um, have used at times, uh, but really, it's uh, sulfur is the main uh, wettable sulfur is the main uh, powdery uh, product that we're using. Then the nutrition side, um, from an organics perspective, uh, organic compost, and then the organic products, uh, zinc and a product called Oro, uh, Oro Boost, and then small amounts of uh, some of the biodynamic uh, preparations uh, used uh, as mm -hmm. well. Majority of nutrition is coming from the compost on the regenerative side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The You're rest of really, I mean, five preparation 500s at ground, ground-based um, uh, prep, biodynamic prep, and the rest mm -hmm. are all like canopy-based uh, uh, applications. Super interesting. Um, I do got to say, just uh, from my experience as a farmer, be careful, everyone, if you're applying sulfur and pure crop oil, you are playing with fire. Uh, yeah. Those can, can, those can yeah. play very unfriendly. Completely. And same within wine grapes. If you're applying uh, oils late, you can get a real delay in maturity there. So, which is why yeah. uh, primarily like 90% of fungicide for powdery is, uh, is sulfur. Yeah, that makes sense. So then we also have a question about the um, YAN, uh, the yeast uh -huh. available nitrogen. Um, Joseph was asking, how does that number, the 218 uh, YAN, compare to historical numbers from the same vineyard block? Hey, Joseph, and you, Joseph, would have great, great questions. And the work that I've done at Bonterra is uh, pretty amazing for a long time. Um, but uh, I, that's a great question. I will have to look into that, Joseph, and uh, come back to you on that one. All right. Um, Keith Hoffman said, surprised not seeing any Cali Green in the spray program. Not sure what product that is. Do you know what that is, King? Um, I don't, I probably should, but. <laughs> Putting you on the spot. Uh, it's like a wash for, uh, for mildew. Got it. No. A6. We really haven't, really haven't had a problem. How are you? With, um, with powdery. Because of the heat, I presume, right? It's just. Yeah, it's a pretty hot, I mean, hot and dry. It's here in Paso for sure, but I think with regular sulfur applications you can um, keep on top of it generally awesome well uh if there's any last questions put them in the chat or you know repeat them if i miss them but um you know we're coming up here at 10.05 um 
you know, I'll, I'll circle back on any last questions that come in, but I just really want to thank you, Kane, so much. Um, I think that it's, um, it's really admirable. And I think it's, there's just a tremendous amount of leadership that you guys show in sharing all of this data, you know, including the cost, the yield, you know, you really lifted the skirt for us and, and gave us a good view into your regenerative program and your the successes and some of the challenges. And I think that um, that's, that's one of the things that's most exciting about the regenerative movement is there really is um, a deep sense of camaraderie and collaboration that I see. Um, and, and you guys really embody that, that leadership. So thanks so much for, for sharing all that you've learned. And I hope you continue to share your learnings uh, along your regenerative journey. Yeah, we most we most definitely will because all of us, regardless of what crops we're farming, we're all, all growing soil. Uh, so it's uh, fascinating to learn from others and some of the other uh, webinars you've done, like with the Brago Fresh team, really, really interesting. So I think the more we can collaborate and share, the better we will be as a uh, multiple industries in, within agriculture, really tackling uh, climate change and then looking forward to the future of how to grow and protect our soils. Amazing. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Again, we'll send a follow-up email with the slides. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, you feel free to email me at charlie at agrology.ag, and I can pass those questions on to Kane. Um, but yeah, thanks, everyone, so much, and I hope everyone has great holidays, and we'll be doing another webinar uh, sometime in January. Great. Bye, Thank everyone. you, Charlie. See you.